All right, hi everybody. Uh, I've got some more people filing in, but we'll go ahead and stick to one o'clock and get started. So welcome. Um, thank you for joining us for our Emerging Invasive Plants in Central Indiana webinar. I'm Claire Lane, the Urban Conservationist at Hamilton County Soil and Water Conservation District and coordinate the Hamilton County CISMA, the Hamilton County Invasives Partnership. Um, so I'm really happy that you guys could join us today to learn about some of the emerging threats and things we need to be on the lookout for here in central Indiana. Um, everyone's welcome to either, you know, keep their video on or you can keep it off. We just ask that everyone stay muted if possible. Uh, we will have some time for questions with Mary at the end, so you can feel free to drop those in the chat box. Uh, as we go along, or you can save them for the end, either dropping them in the chat box or um, we'll have it a time you can come off mute at the end and ask questions as well. So um, I just wanted to take a quick second and tell you a little bit about Hamilton County Invasives Partnership. I know a lot of you are already involved um, or perhaps from a different county. Um, and actually on that note, I'm gonna launch a poll if you guys wouldn't mind to share where you're based just out of interest. Um, but here in Hamilton County, our CISMA is the Invasives Partnership. Uh, we offer a lot of different resources and we partner with a lot of different organizations. But some things you might be interested in would be our invasive species assessments where um, primarily Mary and Taylor, who's also on the webinar, can come out and help you assess your property for invasive species, um, quality natives, and put together a, a management plan to help you go forward in management. We offer a lot of online resources on our website, which is hcinvasives.org, um, about both native plants, invasive plants, management, um, different opportunities to get involved as well. We host a lot of events and workshops, things like we're doing today. Um, uh, hopefully we'll be back, you know, out in the field and having workshops together sooner rather than later, but we're trying to connect um, with a lot of opportunities to learn either remotely or virtually and in person as well. We coordinate um, and organize different volunteer invasive species work days we call weed wrangles. So they are at primarily parks properties um, across the county where people can come and learn about invasives, how to tackle them, um, and be part of a group that is improving their community. We have a tool loan through the Soil and Water Conservation District where you can check out different tools that might help you with your invasive species efforts. Um, our program is open to Hamilton County residents, but we have things like polar bars that can help you pull out invasive shrubs by the root. Um, weed wrangle kits that you can check out and use to um, you for a community weed wrangle or volunteer work day that has a lot of different tools you might need. So I encourage you to check that out as well. Um, that's at the SWCD website. So that's hamiltonswcd.org. And then another program we have um, really launching right now is our strike team, which is more of a like targeted invasive species um, force that's going out and um, assessing, well, assessing and then um, doing management at different, primarily public parks type properties, um, but a good opportunity to get a little more training if you think you might want to be a little more involved with invasive species eradication efforts, either as part of the strike team, or it's a good place to learn if you wanna carry over some of those skills to your own property. So we'd love for anyone to join us, um, whether you're in Hamilton County or not, we meet the first Wednesday of each month. Um, we alternate between noon and 6 p.m. meeting times. Right now we're meeting online, so our next meeting will be September 1st at noon. Um, and if you go to our website, hcinvasives.org, you can, um, on the HIP meetings page under events, you can register and get the link for our next meeting. And we would love to see some of you there. Okay, so let's look at the results of our poll here. Um, we've got 72% from Hamilton County, which is great to see. Um, and another about a quarter um, of us are from elsewhere in central Indiana, which is great. Welcome everybody. Um, I am recording this webinar and we'll make it available um, afterwards via email. And then of course, online and on our social media as well. 
So with that, I am going to introduce Mary. Uh, Mary Wells is a regional specialist with Southern Indiana Cooperative Invasive Management. She holds a BS in biology from Indiana University Bloomington and studied plant pathology at the University of Georgia, Athens. Mary is an active member of her local CISMA, Monroe County Identify and Reduce Invasive Species, and spends most of her free time volunteering to help with invasive plant outreach and control locally, as well as managing invasive plants and landscaping with natives at home. She enjoys exploring natural areas with her husband and canine family member, doing illustration and graphic design, and learning more about native plants and the biodiversity they support. So thank you for being with us, Mary, and I will hand it over to you. Thank you. Um, so I'll quickly share my screen, if that's okay. Awesome. Get my PowerPoint started, bear with me. Okay. One second. <laughs> Always a fun. Uh, okay, to go. Is everyone able to view that? We see it. Okay. Uh, is that poll in your way? I'm trying to get it out of my way. <laughs> I go. don't see a poll. Okay. Good. Good. Thanks, everyone. Um, so. I'm excited to be here today. It's been a joy to work with the Hamilton County Invasives Partnership and their wonderful partners, including the Soil and Water Conservation District. And I think there's some people here from the Hamilton or Carmel Clay Parks and Recreation. So thank you everybody. And for all of us that have made it here today. Um, real quick, I just wanna let you know if, if there's no photo credit, um, it's probably from me. Um, and then all of the maps that you'll be seeing throughout this are made available through the early detection and mapping system, uh, distribution and mapping system, or otherwise known as EDMAPS. So I won't be crediting them each time. So I'm Mary Wells. I am a regional specialist with a group called SICM. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about my group and then we can go through more about emerging invasive plants. So SICM is a nonprofit. Um, it's a coalition of organizations, agencies, governments, and citizen groups. And originally, hence the name, they focused on the 35 counties in Southern Indiana. Um, they entered into a partnership around the end of 2017 to launch a, a statewide program known as the Indiana Invasives Initiative. Um, it's a collaboration with SICM, the NRCS, and other really key partners. Uh, including um, a nature conservancy to raise awareness about uh, and to manage invasive plants statewide. So we are working statewide where one of our goals is to help um, start new groups like Hamilton County Invasives Partnership throughout Indiana to support their work. Uh, and then we have now six staff full time and one part time project coordinator. This is just a map of coverage for the Indiana Invasives Initiative team. So you can see my region is that somewhat centrally located region uh, in the kind of khaki green color in central Indiana. So I mentioned this term SISMA, we throw it around a lot. I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. A SISMA is um, defined as a cooperative invasive species management area. Uh, it's a, again, a partnership organization, not unlike SICM, which could be defined as kind of a larger scale SISMA. Um, and it's formed with the goal of managing invasive species within a specific area across various types of land ownership. Because as we know, invasive species don't really respect property boundaries. So I just have lots of photos to just celebrate Hamilton County Invasive Partnership. This is some of their strategic planning early on, um, a strike team event where we're looking at um, mapping invasives with one of the partners, Carmel Clay Parks and Recreation, uh, celebrating that boot brush station launch that happened this year, um, and then uh, volunteer weed wrangle or community weed wrangle. So there's a lot of SISMAs in Indiana, and that's um, a lot of that's happened since the start of our initiative. Um, the ones that are highlighted in blue are established. Um, they're, they have uh, 
organizational documents and goals and objectives. They're doing the work um, and they're hopefully going to be sustainable into the future. The ones in orange are in that organizational process. That doesn't mean they're not doing anything um, for invasive species, but they're still not fully organized. And the ones in green um, also may be actually doing some invasive species work, but they have yet to organize a formal group. And that's just the logos of the ones that do have logos so far. So pretty fun to share that. <laughs> And Claire, if there's anybody, um, any questions that make sense um, as we go along, don't hesitate to stop me uh, or anyone to ask your question. So today we're gonna talk about definition, make sure we're on the same page with a few definitions, um, talk about invasive plants, their impacts and their spread. And on the other side of that is uh, benefits of native plants. And then really part of this emerging, emerging invasive discussion is the recognizing the importance of early detection. And, and then we'll go through identification of some of the emerging invasive plants here in central Indiana and a few resources and opportunities. So definitions, what is a native species? Um, it's a fairly, fairly open-ended, but a lot of the native species, um, that term we're talking about is pre-settlement of European settlement in North America specifically. But in general, if you're talking worldwide, it's a, a plant, animal, or some other type of organism that has evolved in a given place over a period of time sufficient to develop complex and essential relationships with the physical environment and other organiza organisms in a given ecological community. We really like that quote because it's, it sums it up, but it leaves it very open-ended because uh, a native something could be native to the Eastern United States. It could be native to central Indiana or a watershed, or it could be native to a very specific region. Um, for example, the remnant prairie in Northwest Indiana. <clears throat> so I left, I put the oak species in here, the white oak, because um, it's a keystone species for this part of the world. Um, and so much um, depends on our oak hickory communities. Um, one of our native moth caterpillars, I think this is the polyphemus moth. <clears throat> um, going on from there, uh, spice fish, swallowtail butterfly <clears throat> on our native, nectaring on our native uh, butterfly milkweed. A specialist ironweed bee um, on uh, an ironweed flower and our native goldfinches on a blazing star. <clears throat> on the other side of that coin, an invasive species by the federal definition is first and foremost non-native um, and whose introduction causes is likely to cause harm. And that harm is economic, environmental, harm to human, animal, plant health. It's often a composite of those. And to the right, we have that ubiquitous um, invasive plant, garlic mustard. It's pretty much everywhere throughout our state, unfortunately. And then of course, the emerald ash borer, which is also um, everywhere throughout the state, decimating our, our ash populations. Um, some aquatic invasives, zebra mussels, and some Asian carp. Those are ones that people are very well, well aware of. Um, so invasive species cause harm. That harm is, is multifaceted and it's not mutually exclusive. So we've talked about some of the first ones here, but in general, it affects our natural resources, which is our water quality, our soil health, which in turn affects agricultural yield, our energy efficiency um, is, has a massive effects on our recreation, our tourism, cultural resources, our infrastructure, our economy, our military and first responder state of readiness, public utilities, property values, and just our mental health or sense of place. <clears throat> so invasives by the numbers, they are considered the second leading threat to biodiversity and the second leading um, risk to our forest. Of course, habitat loss due to human activities is first in both cases. Um, and that habitat loss is tied into climate change. So climate change is lumped into that first threat. Um, annually, the United States Geological Survey has estimated that the environmental, medical, and economic costs of invasive species are greater than the costs of all other natural disasters combined. 
the invasive species are a natural disaster and unfortunately an unrecognized one. So we have kudzu over here on the right. Um, <clears throat> the economic damage is estimated uh, to be 10 times greater than the costs of management now and where we're at in 2020, as of 2020. So we have kudzu over here. I just threw up a map because most people don't realize kudzu is in Indiana um, and it's in about half of the counties. Um, and fortunately there is none in Hamilton County, but if you look, it's just South in Marion County and Hendricks County. <clears throat> and bottom line, our biodiversity is imperiled. Um, our key, as a kind of keystone species that everybody knows and loves, our monarch population declines over 80% um, in just a 20 year period. Um, we're seeing approximately or estimated 75% decline in flying insect biomass in less than 30 years. Um, North American bird populations are declining by, are showing declines of greater than 25% in a 50 year period. Um, and up to 1 million plant and animal species face extinction, many in just a matter of decades. <clears throat> So it's not just invasive species doing all of this, but it's a factor and a huge one because um, invasive species displace our native plants and other organisms, um, and uh, they just disrupt food webs. So as we know, the classic example of our native birds requiring native plants because native plants support the caterpillars and other insects that they use to raise their young. Invasives spread many ways, unfortunately. Uh, a lot of them are escapes from our intentional landscapes. Um, sometimes they're in seed mixes or soil materials, or sometimes they're actively promoted in the past or currently for livestock, agriculture, erosion control, wildlife habitat, and often they're poorly suited for those functions. <clears throat> sometimes dried craft arrangements. A lot of aquatics are coming in on boats or aquarium stock. Uh, large equipment, vehicles, birds, animals, water, wind, weather, you name it, and some of them just by spreading. <clears throat> and just a real quick, there, you know, there's about 235 woody plant species that have escaped into North America, um, and about 85% were introduced for landscapes. Um, and then about 14 were for agriculture, production, forestry. So 99% of the ones that are now becoming somewhat invasive were intentionally introduced. So the classic example is the calorie pear planted in our decorative landscapes and slowly creeping into our right-of-way areas and past our right-of-ways into our forests. And then all of a sudden it's taking over an entire natural area. Um, so what do we do? How do we deal with invasive species? Prevention is key so we can regulate them. Um, sometimes you need to know more about them in order to even consider regulation. So early detection is part of that. Um, and then from there, we won't go into it today, control and management, and sometimes restoration. Sometimes you can allow native plants to restore themselves, but occasionally um, you have to take some active steps if, They've done a lot of damage. So real quick, we had a rule finally passed last year, the terrestrial plant rule that did restrict 44 species. Um, and about half of those were at one point in the nursery trade. So that's very exciting. Um, so we, we made a first huge step. We just need to get more species added. And part of that is early detection or just um, getting a really good feel for how um, much of a problem certain species are. Um, so early detection and rapid response uh, can stop the spread of new and emerging invasives before they become established. It is one of the most cost-effective and ecologically viable methods for controlling invasives and is well worth the effort to protect our, our natural and agricultural resources. So if you see here, if we catch them early, the cost to control um, are much less and the area infested is much less. Um, and as we get to the point where public awareness happens on a larger scale, sometimes uh, it's not even possible to consider eradication. We're just managing and the costs are much higher. 
Um, and I, I mentioned this earlier, but here in Indiana, throughout the Midwest, and actually the system is used throughout North America, um, the early detection and distribution mapping system is really effective, especially for this early detection mapping. Um, it's online, so you can access it via computer or smartphone or smart device. It allows both professionals and citizens to report invasives. Um, and that system has been created by the Center for Invasive Species and Ecosystem Health down at the University of Georgia in Athens. And so, um, oh, go back real quick. Just wanna give you an overview. There's a lot of emerging invasives. It's really hard to pick. So I've picked a few, some of them um, came in for the nursery trade and some of them um, were mistakenly introduced. So just giving you the range here today. And some of them are not, uh, emerging in Indiana. Some of them are just more kind of early stages in central Indiana. So we'll talk about it based on growth habits, starting with our grasses. And this one is, I can't stop seeing it. I see it everywhere I go in my area of Indiana. And that is Japanese stilt grass. Um, it's an annual grass introduced, they believe, as packing material for porcelain from Asia. Um, and it loves a wide variety of habitats. It uh, can grow up to four feet tall, but it, when it does, it kind of lays over or sprawls over other growth. It's alternate leaved. Um, the leaves are very lance shaped, um, fairly short and wide with that um, silvery mid vein, very distinctive. Um, they do have a small flower. It's very nondescript um, and it produces that in late summer and seed starts to um, be produced in late August to early September through October. And it spreads aggressively by seed. Um, and it's easy to spread mistakenly by water, animals, vehicles, equipment, the soles of our shoes, deer, um, spread this one around. And that little star indicates that it's on the terrestrial plant roll. So it, it is regulated in the state. Uh, this is a photo of what happens when Japanese stilt grass goes dormant. It forms this like orangish red thatch. So it's commonly found in forested bottomlands and along um, waterways. Um, so that's how it's spread a lot of the times. It's very shade tolerant. Um, it has a very diverse habitat range. So it can once it, it can go up into upland forest, understory, roadside right-of-ways, and I'm seeing it more and more in my county, even in residential gardens and lawns. So that's another management challenge. Um, the plants can produce seed uh, even after um, mowing, so it'll float, flower before mowing, below mowing height. Um, and they are now believing that seed bank can persist for five to seven years. So you can't just stop, manage it once and done. It's an ongoing process once you're dealing with it. Um, and it can completely replace understory vegetation in three to five years and suppress tree regeneration. In addition, that thatch um, can affect um, fire regimes and other natural management that people use for land. Um, and that's the map here in Indiana. So not an early detection species in anymore in Indiana, however, in Hamilton County, it has yet to be reported. That may or may not be the case, because if you look next door to the, to the west, it's in Boone County and south to Marion County. Um, I do have some resources on here, but we won't go into detail, but I can always supply a PDF so people can access more if they want to learn. Another grass we'll talk about, um, unfortunately, is our ornamental silver grasses the miscanthus, miscanthus species. So we have Chinese silvergrass, the amber silvergrass, which is less common, and then that very common hybrid um, miscanthus. They're introduced from Asia as an ornamental. The Chinese silvergrass, miscanthus sinensis, has over 40, I'm sorry, 50 ornamental cultivars out there in the world. That's a lot of potential genetic variation and um, cross-pollinating. It's also used in deer screen plantings and occasionally that hybrid, um, the rhizomes from the hybrid are for some reason being used for erosion control. No, no, no clue why. Um, so it's tall perennial clump forming, um, very showy plumes. Um, the height can be three to 10 inches. Um, has a very distinct mid vein. So even on the variegated, you can see it has a white mid vein. 
Um, and there are lots of variegated cultivars out there. And then that showy plume or seed head, which persists. And that seed is windborne. And then the plants can also spread by rhizome. So I'm seeing it more and more, especially in Southern Indiana, along roadside right of ways and in any open fields. Uh, it's also been documented, not in Indiana, but elsewhere to begin invading forest edges and understories. And it is unfortunately the most widely used ornamental plant that I'm aware of. So it could be a really bad problem really quick. Um, and it has recently been evaluated as a high rank invasive here in Indiana. We do have a native lookalike, but it's only in Southern Indiana and that's known as silver plume grass, but it's a bit taller and has other leaf differences. So this is the map of Miscanthus, uh, I believe Miscanthus sinensis, yep, so Chinese silver grass. And it is in Hamilton County. So it's escaping our landscapes. Um, so if we can try to catch this one, we can prevent it from becoming more of a problem. More resources. So we're gonna switch growth habit and talk about um, and forbs. And that term forb I should have defined a little bit better, but it's basically a herbaceous plant that's a non-grass invasive plant. Or, or I'm sorry, a non-grass herbaceous plant. So forb applies to various types of plants, both native and invasive. So chaff flower is definitely a early detection species for central Indiana. Uh, it's perennial. It's fairly nondescript. Uh, it has opposite simple leaves. The leaves don't have teeth. Um, until it flowers, I think it would be really tough to tell this one apart. Um, some people say it even looks like a young dogwood tree or shrub um, before it flowers. It's, uh, the flowers are kind of the, the spikes with the, 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 flow, the florets coming off at right angles. Once the seeds start ripening, they lay down along that spike. Um, and it uh, produces seeds that have these bracts that help it um, get dispersed by animals or water. You can see here this cute Pyrenees dog has a lot of chaff flower in its fur. Uh, and these are some photos of what chaff flower looks like a little later in the season as it starts going um, to seed. And you can tell it just looks like a weedy plant. Um, so once you start seeing it, you can start getting an eye for it, but by the time you really start realizing it's a problem, it's, it's, it's taking over large areas. Um, so it's mostly along the Ohio River here in Indiana, um, but it does like to spread along riverways and tributaries. Um, prefers part sun and moist soil, but it can get up in deep shade and dry upland conditions. Um, very dense, tall growth habit, um, really just kind of outcompetes everything. And like I said, it spreads along waterways, but also via animals, equipment. Uh, we do have a couple native lookalikes I'll mention, uh, our native lop seed and our native white vervain, depending, depending on where you're at in the growing season, may resemble Japanese chaff flower. And there was recently a Japanese chaff flower summit in Southern Indiana because um, they're really just trying to learn more about the species. There's a lot of information that needs more research, including how long that seed bank can be residual. Um, some more resources there. One uh, other forb or flowering herbaceous plant, that's not a grass, um, that I would like to talk about today as we're getting into bulb planting season is Siberian squill. And this one is still very much uh, for sale and, and very much unrecognized as an invasive. Um, and you can buy the bulbs in catalogs or at your local garden center. Um, it's a, been around for a while. It's, it's an ornamental flowering bulb so that it's dormant in late spring through winter. Um, kind of grass-like leaves with these bell-shaped flowers that are about an inch wide. Um, they have six tepals, which is three um, petals, three sepals, and the flower is mostly blue purple, but it can range depending on the cultivar to white to pink to violet. Um, and it reproduces not just by those bulbs, but by seeds. So that's where it starts to become more of a problem. This is a photo from a college campus at Iowa State University. Um, so it can really take over a woodland understory. Um, it's cold tolerant. Um, it's toxic to herbivores, so they don't eat it. Um, 
And it's easy to also just accidentally move it around by soil because it has tiny little bulblets that can break off and get moved around, not unlike lesser celandine. Uh, and once established, these bulb plants are very, very difficult to control. Um, we do have a plant that could be considered a native lookalike. Um, I don't think it's too similar, but our wild hyacinth is um, blooms a little around the same time. It's a taller plant with larger floppy leaves and um, a lot of flowers along a, a spike. So this one is truly an emerging invasive in Indiana. So it's only just been reported escaping in a few counties and currently none in Hamilton. Uh, shrubs, let's talk about invasive shrubs, um, getting into the ones that were introduced via ornamental trade. So this plant is probably the, one of the most widely used and still legally allowed to be sold um, in, in widely used in ornamental landscaping. So Japanese spirea, that characteristic pink flower and that yellow green foliage, um, it's fairly short stature um, and has those umbels of flat topped umbels of flowers. And it does tolerate a wide range of conditions, uh, grows best in full sun to part shade. So the two photos are just for ID, but the one on the right is actually one of the locations that was spotted by one of my coworkers in Western Indiana, West Central Indiana, um, spreading along a utility right of way. And that's pretty much all Japanese spirea. And then another uh, person that's an invasive species specialist in Southern Indiana has observed this colony in another right of way in, in, in Indiana. So it can spread quickly, um, forms dense thickets, and it's believed that its seed bank can persist for multiple years, which is not always the case for these invasive shrubs. We do have two native, um, two common native um, spirea here in Indiana or meadowsweet, but they, they have a distinctly different flowering um, shape. It's more of a pyramid shape and their habitat preferences are different. Um, so that's the map. It is um, an early detection species. Um, so this is one we could stop if we're able to regulate it early enough. And this one is not as much of a huge problem escaping yet, but um, it's a southern species and with climate change, it could move north. Um, and it's a very common landscape plant. Uh, sacred bamboo, too pretty of a name for this plant. Um, I just call it Nambina. <laughs> it's semi evergreen, uh, has really interesting fall foliage color, and then these attractive berries, which unfortunately are toxic to um, fruit loving birds and other wildlife. So, um, just a plant that would be really nice if people just decided to skip and replace with natives that actually support our wildlife. Um, shade tolerant, um, forest invader. Again, spread by birds and also spreads by rhizomes, which um, means it's a thicket forming species. And as far as I know, I can't think of a native that looks that much like it. And as you can see, it's not reported as uh, escaped here in Indiana, though I know that I have talked to coworkers in Southern Indiana and they have, they have said that they see it starting to, to spread from intentional plantings. A few resources, not a ton out there, mostly from the southern United States. <clears throat> Moving on to our next growth habit, invasive trees. Um, trying to keep it limited to two per growth habit. There's so many more out there, I promise. <laughs> so uh, talking about a, an invasive tree known as amber cork tree. Um, it was it was more popular as a landscape tree. Um, it's less so now but people really like that short trunk and wide branching structure. Um, it, I just wanna show you the leaves straight up because to me, it really much resembles one of our native ash trees. It's got that opposite branching and the compound leaves. Uh, it produces fruits, which of course are then spread by wild birds. Um, one really easy way to tell this plant apart, e even on the younger ones is that yellow inner bark. Um, and when it does get more mature, the bark is very um, warty and thick, corky. Um, 
and the, the the leaves and the bark, they smell like kind of citrusy turpentine. So, and it's believed some of that compound can suppress other plants. If you look underneath this colony, there's nothing really growing underneath it. It's a shade tolerant species um, and it produces very dense shade. And of course, our herbivores will avoid it, which give it a competitive advantage. And again, it looks like our native ash tree. <clears throat> and this is the current reported distribution. And our next tree, this used to be, I used to love this tree when I was younger before I knew better. Now, after living in Georgia, I definitely know better. Uh, it's pretty bad in the South. So it's a deciduous tree. It's in the legume family. Um, it has these really cute pink puff balls of flowers that literally do smell like champagne and orange juice. Um, and it's a colony former and it spreads by seed uh, and rhizome. It produces seed that looks very much like a red bud seed also in the legume family. And that seed will persist into winter. Some people think that the younger plants um, might be mistaken for a young honey locust based on those compound leaves. And uh, I mentioned colony former. Yes, it's a colony former and it can grow in pretty much any growing condition. And it's a nitrogen fixer. So it favors um, that, that high nitrogen will favor more mimosa or other invasive plants. Um, and it's originally just in the Southern counties, but it's pretty much halfway up the state. And so, um, you know, it's, it's one that I don't see for sale very often, but people think it's adorable and they try to propagate it and spread it around to their neighbors. <clears throat> so more resources. So last but not least are invasive vines. Um, these guys scare me. Uh, so this uh, photo here, is of mile a minute vine. It's a true early detection species for Indiana. Um, just that close up is really helpful because it shows that very triangular shaped leaf, almost like an equilateral triangle. Sorry. Uh, and you can see here that it almost has like little barbs along the stem. And then they have these round oak reel um, structures on the that's um, these circular structures, very characteristic. And then the fruits are almost iridescent blue. Um, and it's, uh, it's an annual, <laughs> so it's uh, scary. So these pictures I've showed you before, those are not from Indiana. Um, and you can see here with the mile a minute vine, this, the stilt grass growing right below it. <laughs> Just wanted to point that one out. Um, this is actually um, a photo of uh, infestation here in Indiana. So um, this species is reported in one county, that's my county, and they're, it's in a, in a small geographic area. It was found by um, a restoration ecological um, consultant that was doing a, a mitigation survey. And um, it's, been being, it's been controlled for about three to four years now, and it's not eradicated. So somehow those fruits are still getting out, unfortunately. Um, so it's a spring germinator, it has rapid growth, it grows fast and kind of overtakes everything in its wake. So yeah, we were hoping to keep it out. And this is a photo of this year, getting out and controlling it. This is Ellen down in my county, spraying a few patches that we came across. And I really wanted to showcase the lookalikes for this because um, they're getting a lot of false reports. Um, so we have some, a lot of native lookalikes. We have the halberd leaf um, terathum and some of the other uh, native terathum species. They have the barb, they're, they're in the same family, um, but that leaf is very halberd shaped. It's not a perfect triangle, it kind of dips down right in the center. And then to the right is the um, very common, this time of year, climbing false buckwheat. Uh, it's a vine as well, um, but that's very distinctly heart-shaped. Uh, the hedge false bindweed, I'm getting into our bindweeds, they're so hard to tell apart. Um, that one is also very halberd shaped. It kind of dips down right in the center where the stem is. And our, some of our morning glories have that heart shape. Um, some of them are ivy leaf shaped. 
Uh, and then we also have the non-native field bind weed, which is very heart or halberd shaped. So just to help people make sure that they're not looking at um, one of the more common plants that are native or common here in Indiana. All right, um, the last vine we'll get into is swallow warts. Um, there's two species that are um, early detection species throughout the state, the black and pale swallow wart, um, very similar. They're also known as dog strangling vine. Um, two, there's kind of two genus that are used for these species that are used interchangeably, in, interchangeably. so cyanantrum and then vincitoxicum, I believe. Um, so on the left, we have black swallowwort. Um, the leaves are described as darker green um, with very purplish flowers. On the right, we have the pale swallowwort. The flowers are kind of rose to pink to red um, and the leaves are more bright green. And they have pods and you'll see those pods look like milkweeds because they are related to our native milkweeds. Um, but, however, these are from Europe and the Ukraine and parts of Russia. And for whatever reason, I don't think they're attractive, but they were first introduced as ornamental. Um, mostly a problem out east, um, but there has been reports as early as 2009 in Indiana. Um, and those seed pods, they, they, they grow along edges and those seed pods can be spread um, along pastures if they get hay. It's one way it could be spread. So this is the reports of the black up top and then down below, uh, pale is not yet reported currently. Uh, yeah. And it just forms these blanket thatches or woven vines um, when it takes over an area. And um, they can persist in shaded areas, but they really do need a little bit of light to grow. And um, I'm not sure what it is that's doing that, but it does alter some soil microbe communities. And the big one here is that it's toxic to our monarch butterfly larva. If the adults lay their eggs on these species, um, the caterpillars will not live to adulthood or to um, even pass the caterpillar stage. It's a little bit unsure how much monarchs will actually be attracted to these species, but it's just really good to be on the lookout. And if you see them, please report them. Um, and then this is our native lookalikes. Um, we have the native honey vine, which is also related to milkweed um, and does support our monarchs. It has, it's a vine, it has pods. The vine, um, the, the leaves are kind of more heart shaped or halberd shaped. Um, and those pods are distinctly wider. And then on the right, the pods themselves of both of these swallowworts are very similar in appearance to the butterfly milkweed pods. However, butterfly milkweed is not a vining plant. So that growth habit should indicate that it's a good guy, not a bad guy. All right, so that kind of wraps up that portion. I just wanna go through some resources to learn more and ways to get involved for those that aren't aren't already, <laughs> aren't already drinking the Kool-Aid. Um, all these photos are of Hamilton County and Basis Partnership because I've just got to promote them because they're doing such good work. Um, so we have a lot of great resources here in Indiana. We have this guide to the regulated terrestrial invasive plant species, um, which um, it's part, partly put together through the Indiana Invasive Species Council and the Nature Conservancy and the Indiana Native Plant Society. Um, so both the Indiana Invasive Species Council and their advisory committee for plants has a lot of resources. And then the resources on the Sikkim website are also pretty extensive. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. And then I just wanted to throw in there because Hamilton County Invasives Partnership is building their website and they have a lot of great resources um, and some of those to redirect to these statewide resources. There's um, more online resources statewide and beyond. So Purdue Extension has some great resources and also a reporting system, especially for um, invasive pests like insects or disease. Um, DNR has a lot of information on their website for invasive species, um, whether they're terrestrial, aquatic, etc. The Midwest Invasive, 
invasive plant network um, has a lot of information um, and tied to that is the woody invasives of the Great Lake Cooperative. So uh, if you have a woody invasive and you need help, that's a good place to start. Um, I mentioned the EDMAPS or early detection and distribution mapping system. Not only does it have these maps, but it also has information about the species, uh, resources to link to and photos. And then um, some information through the North American Invasive Species Management Association. Um, there's some really great guides out there, some of them specifically for emerging invasives. That top left one I've referenced several times in the resources. Um, and you can download a PDF, but there's also an interactive version of it on, a web, on the website that I've posted several times throughout this. Um, the two, the two new invader um, resources through the USDA are excellent. Um, the Northeast and the North Central, super helpful. And then we need to start thinking about Southeast. So that's why I'm throwing these Southeast in there because plants that are new invaders to the Southeast may also be a risk with climate shifts. And that's why I put in this last book at the bottom the invasive plants in Southern forest. Um, we just also need, just need to keep our eye on what's troubling the South because it could be coming our way. And other inspiring books, I won't go into too much detail. Some of them are just ID. Some of them help you identify natives versus invasive. Um, some of them just talk more about the importance of planting native and controlling invasives, um, highlighting three books by the author, Douglas Tallamy, who's an entomologist that has been studying the importance of um, Native plants, 75% native plants in our properties. We need them, everything needs them. <laughs> um, and gardeners, please be on the lookout. Um, we're, we're kind of the, 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 the first line of defense. Um, some plants were or still are um, sold as ornamentals. Unfortunately, burning bush, which is highly invasive is still for sale. Um, hope, hoping to get that regulated in years to follow. Um, and then interestingly, some of the plants that are regulated are mislabeled and they're still trying to sell them. Um, this is uh, regulated by the Indiana Department of Natural Resources Division of Entomology and Plant Pathology. I get their weekly newsletter and one of the, the nursery inspectors just reported someone selling purple winter creeper, um, even though it's been regulated for over a year. And this is a cultivar purple winter creeper, which can makes it even more confusing. Um, and then plants sometimes are intentionally or mis mistakenly mislabeled. Um, sometimes there's multiple plant names. We've even encountered that just with the swallow warts. Sometimes they're intentionally in seed mixes or they're contaminated um, contaminants in seed mixes. So if you get a, buy a seed mix for pollinators, if you get one for free, uh, read that la label, make sure that uh, it is plants that are supposed to be here. Um, and that they're not potentially invasive. And then there's unregulated sellers online. We have a very few number of um, nursery inspectors. They can't catch everything and um, it's hard enough to catch it from brick and mortar stores, much less stuff that's being shipped out of state. And moving soil. Soil is a dirty business. Um, invasive plant propagules can be in anything, including uh, the mower deck of the mower that you hire to, to mow your yard or um, someone that's coming in to log your property if you're managing for forest um, production or someone that's even just coming in to like put in a new sewer system or um, an addition to your house. Um, so people need to come and clean. Um, we have a neighborhood here in Indiana that there's still grass infestation has come in through um, a company that mows all their properties. Um, so they're just spreading it around. Running out of time, so I'll go through this. The Indiana Native Plant Society, I've mentioned them a few times, a great resource. They have a newly updated website and they have a, a directory called the Grow Indiana Natives Program that lists um, plant sellers in Indiana who sell native plants and have made the important pledge not to sell invasive plants. So they may sell non-natives, but they're not selling plants that are known to be invasive. Um, and then you can also certify your property to let your friends and neighbors know that you are a, a, a native plant person. Um, you can get direct assistance. Claire mentioned that um, free for the most part, technical assistance. Um, you may be able to provide cost share options for those that qualify. Um, you can visit our website or other um, Hamilton County specific websites to learn more. 
And if you prime invasive plants, get rid of them. Mechanical control sometimes works, though sometimes herbicide can be the best tool. Um, and just word to the wise, avoid composting live invasive plant material. So that's seed, uh, roots, or sometimes even vining plant parts. Um, and keep it clean. <laughs> and volunteer to weed wrangle. They're fun. We need to have fun because invasive species can get us all down. So we need to work together and meet other people that care. Uh, learn a little bit. Take it home with you. Get connected. Um, there's an event coming up on October 9th and possibly more um, with uh, at Cool Creek Park. Um, you can visit and stay up to date on the hcinvasives.org website. Um, we have a full state listing on our Sikkim website. Um, so if you're not in Hamilton County, you can find a weed wrangle in your area. Uh, connect with your local SISMA. I can't say SISMA enough. Um, <laughs> and um, I crack, this cracks me up. Spread the word. They have these amazing billboards down in the Boys County. The SISMA there puts them out every year. Um, this particular one cracks me up because it's, you know, showing the hammer next door. And he really seems like he's on board for breaking up with your burning bush. And thank you. It's been an honor and I'm hoping there's time for questions. Yeah, I think so. Thank you, Mary, that was great. Um, yeah, people would like to put questions in the chat. That'd be great. I know we had one. Um, Mary, do you know anything about the invasiveness of mock strawberry? Yeah, I, I don't know if that one's actually been ranked. Um, I don't see it a lot in high quality natural areas. I see it in my garden. <laughs> um, that and Creeping Charlie, uh, which is considered a um, invasive plant here in the state. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's kind of a low rank if it's been ranked and if not, um, it's, it's just a pain, I get it. It's in our turf grass, it's in our garden beds, um, but I, I, it would be not my first priority if I were evaluating a property for invasives. <clears throat> um, porcelain berry, is yes. it classified as invasive? It is, <clears throat> and it's in Southern Indiana. It could have easily been on my invasive vine list um, because it was an ornamental vine. It's a little confusing because we have some native vines that are related to porcelain berry that are easily mistaken. So it's not one I wanted to take on and talk about lightly because I didn't want to, um, I guess, confuse anyone because I don't think that I actually have any personal experience with that vine. Okay. All right, uh, Joanna dropped in the in the chat after Brenda said, love the billboard. And Joanna said, how do we get long, one along 465? Yeah, I think that would be great. Um, maybe particularly up by that um, parcel of land just inside Marion County off um, on the south side of Carmel. Actually, I think that land is potentially getting developed though. So um, maybe they'll take care of those Bradford pears. But yeah, that'd be really cool. I, I'm imagining that probably billboard space is a little more expensive up here <laughs> than in Dubois County. But maybe yeah, that's I know that if we band it yeah. together, we could figure out. I know that Emily works down there. Um, Emily Finch works with Lamar, which I guess is probably the statewide billboard company. Um, and they even do the design for her. She supplies oh, them. Cool. And I don't know. <laughs> she would be happy to We're put you in touch in with them. Too. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Harry Vetch, question in the chat. Well, Harry Vetch, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not a cover crop person. <laughs> so it, we, the main invasive that's related to that is crown vetch. And gosh, it's a terrible one. Um, the seeds persist, it's all along our highway right of ways and it was used intentionally as erosion control. For Harry Vetch, Claire, do you know anything? Or Taylor? Um, it is, it's commonly used as a cover crop here. There haven't been a lot of reports. I know if you look it up online, there have been reports of it escaping in some areas, but none in Indiana that I know of. But that's a great question. 
I've seen it in weird places, but it's always kind of like in right of way areas and that's about it. So I'm just assuming it got there somehow. Okay, there was a question. Is HIP doing anything about the cow repair along the Hague Trail, State Road 38 in Noblesville? Um, so a lot of that is Noblesville um, City Parks property and they are attempting slowly but attempting to address some of it um, so that's a, definitely a really high profile area for invasives absolutely so um, coordinating with what city parks is doing uh, for sure but it, it's definitely on our list potentially as you know a good a good spot for maybe some weed wrangles or something like that calorie pair at that size is kind of a beast. Um, that's not really something you can do at a volunteer work day, um, but it's definitely on our radar for sure. Okay, Creeping Jenny, is it invasive? Yes, that one is another one that was recently re-ranked. Um, <clears throat> and it's, it's also known as money wart. Um, it's kind of, for those that like to do decorative um, plant planters, it's the draper one of the drapers. Um, so it's kind of like a chartreuse color, but it's actually a wetland invader and um, it's ubiquitous throughout the state. Um, so early detection is it's past that point. It's more of just determining how much of it, it impacts our natural areas. Um, and it doesn't really respond well to herbicides. So at the very least, I would just find a substitute if you do like to um, use planters. Um, there's probably some natives or some non-invasive um, exotics that you could use instead. Um, Jessica, who works for TNC at Kankakee Sands in Newton County says they are seeing hairy vetch escaping into their prairie landscapes. So that's good to know. Thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Um, Catherine asked in the chat, what's that? Oh, go ahead, sorry. Well, just um, a, a question about the best way to remove an established burning bush. Good question. Um, if you want that stump out of there, I would hire a contractor um, that can at least grind your stump. But if you're willing to just cut it and let that um, stump uh, and root system kind of biodegrade, you can cut it and then immediately apply a concentrated solution of glyphosate, um, which is readily available. Um, and it's just a small amount directly to the cut. And uh, I like to use the term cut once and done. So theoretically, um, you don't have to cut it over and over again. Um, that would be the most efficient way. And I see that. Um, Oh yeah, we're going back to, I'm looking at the chats too, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, are all barberry invasive? So we had a native barberry that we basically um, extirpated from the state because it harbored a, a, de, a, a rust disease of cereal crops. Um, and unfortunately the Japanese barberry doesn't really harbor that. So that's why it's so ubiquitous. Um, and so I would say most of the barberry you're gonna encounter are non-native um, and I've only encountered Japanese barberry. I think I remember Andrew asking me that question once upon a time. <laughs> so, and barberry is also um, highly um, correlated with high levels of tick populations and tick-borne illness. So it's, it's a bad one. Um, I don't see any other questions. Um, do you know? Yeah. Oh, are you asking how do you compare, how do you um, differentiate between hairy vetch and crown vetch? Um, the flower is very distinctive and I believe it's crown vetch that doesn't have those wrapping spirals. I think all the other vetches, whether they're native or non-native, have a kind of a wrapping spiral. Thank you, Brenda. Hi. <laughs> um, 
Um, I did put in the chat a link to a research summary I just read this morning um, talking about the importance of regulating invasive plants and how it's working and how we just need to keep up with it. Um, and it's important that part of that is early detection or just um, early reporting of um, plants that are past that early detection phase so we can get them regulated because all the plants that were regulated under that terrestrial plant rule were ranked as high invasives in the state and that required data. And a lot of that data came through the EDMAPS reporting. So we're all important, we all can make a difference. And then also just spreading the word. Um, I guess we need to break up with our Japanese spirea next. <laughs> All right, and we have, we do have that other webinar. I'll try to remember to share it in the, uh, in the follow-up email that has the recording, but we also have a recorded presentation from last year um, going through how to report to EDMAPS. So if you're seeing some of these species, it'll take you through exactly how to report those in um, to contribute to our knowledge about their distribution and, and what's a problem. And then eventually potentially um, help with getting different plants regulated. So, okay, uh, it's 2.01. So with that, I think we'll close it down. Um, I'll follow up with an email with some resources. Mary, if there's anything you want me to include in that, just send it my way. Um, and I will get that out to all of you, but um, please feel free to share the recording or the information that you found here. Hopefully we'll see some of you in our next HIT meeting or you will seek out your SISMA that's close to home. Um, but yeah, thank you so much, Mary. That was great. Um, really great to know what we need to be concerned about. And yeah, hope you all have a great rest of the day. Thanks again. Thank you. Clara, um, I updated the 